Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is our second episode. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined by my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Good to be here, Zaki. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say the reaction to episode one has been pretty overwhelmingly positive, and that's been a big ego boost for us, given how much uh, time and energy we put into planning the show. So uh, we're hoping to keep that enthusiasm and that energy moving forward. So for our second episode, as we talk about the American Muslim experience, I think that we can't talk about that without talking about CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. This is a civil rights organization that speaks to not only the concerns of Muslims in America, but also other uh, religious and minority groups. And it is both a cause celeb and a cause controversy, depending on who you're talking to. And so here to talk to us about care is somebody who uh, I have a great deal of respect for, Zahra Billu, who is the executive director of the San Francisco office of care. And uh, Zahra has been the ED for uh, about four years now, That's since, right, yeah. since 2009. And so uh, we well, first let me welcome you. Thank you for joining us, Zahra. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's an honor. Uh, I guess and a happy belated birthday as well to Zara. That's right. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Uh, welcome to your thirties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a brave new world. That's what I'm told. <laughs> So, so just to start things off, and, and we want to definitely get to where your path intersects with CARE, but I think for the sake of our audience, uh, CARE has been around for just about 20 years now, just under 20 years now. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit of the history of the organization, uh, where it came from, and uh, what it's all about. Sure. So CARE, or the Council on American Islamic Relations, is the nation's largest American Muslim civil rights organization. It was started in 1994 by... Um, a group of activists and leaders on the other side of the country, as well as some that were based right here in the Bay Area. Its mission is to promote justice, enhance the understanding of Islam, and, and empower American Muslims. And we do that through a couple of different, what I call, strategies for change. So we work with the media to amplify the voice of the Muslim community. Um, and that it's really important for us to make sure that American Muslims know how to engage the media and that media professionals knew, know where to find genuine and authentic Muslim voices. We work with elected officials, um, again, on two fronts to make sure that American Muslims are engaging with our elected officials, are empowered, are voting, and are holding their elected officials accountable, both when they do good and bad. And that elected officials know that they have American Muslim constituents, that they are passing and, and sometimes voting against policies that, that our community is going to care strongly about, and not just on civil rights issues or mosque issues, but also things like health care, education, taxes. We do outreach, and outreach is a, a huge part of our work. Uh, outside the Muslim community, it's about building understanding and bridges of, of alliance. Uh, we recognize that the Muslim community alone is too small to make any major change, that we need to build relationships with people of other faiths, of no faith at all, in the civil rights community, in the activist community, and then outreach inside the Muslim community as well. We can't do our civil rights work if people don't know what their rights are. We can't help them or provide the free legal services if they're not calling us. And so a lot of the outreach that we do inside the Muslim community is, is education focused, really empowering people with information about their rights. The core of our work, the thing that I am most passionate about is the direct legal services that we provide to community members. And this has been sort of an evolving thing. Uh, probably in the first decade or so, there were just a couple of attorneys on staff across uh, care offices. And now there are over 20 uh, attorneys that work for care across the country that all provide free, uh, direct, personal, confidential legal advice and assistance to American Muslims and others complaining of civil rights violations. And so care originally started in, where, where was the first uh, office located? So a lot, of, so a lot of people don't realize that the first chapter office for CARE was actually in the Bay Area. So right. CARE is headquartered in D.C., but right. the first chapter office, one of our founders, was based right here in Santa Clara. And so we are the oldest CARE chapter in the country as well. Wow. So, And, and there are how many chapters now? So today there are something, um, I think, over 25 chapters across the country, with four of them being in, in California. We have a couple in Florida. Um, there are a lot of care offices in metropolitan areas. I think that sometimes where we feel the gap or the most pain is in is in the Midwest, places where sometimes people need the most help and there just aren't very many resources all around. So is that is that a gap that you're hoping can be addressed? And it's a it's a gap that we're definitely working to address. Um, you know, in recent years with uh, Islamophobia on the rise and, and the, 
somewhat on the rise in civil rights violations being consistent in places like Tennessee and Arkansas and Utah. We we do recognize that there is an issue and are trying our best to do what we can. At the same time, at least for those of us that are attorneys and licensed in one place, we're not really excited about moving and taking the bar in other places. <laughs> now, now you mentioned the term Islamophobia, and this is this is this is a term itself that comes under fire because there are people out there who say, "Oh, there's no such thing." And I think it might be helpful. Can you define that term in in terms of how it's uh, how it finds expression uh, across the country? So paraphrasing uh, a bit here, CARE's definition of Islamophobia is a closed-minded prejudice or a prejudice or view of Islam and Muslims. And we make distinctions between um, unintentional Islamophobia, so people who maybe consume the fear-mongering, as well as people who um, are malicious in their fear-mongering, so the Pamela Gellers, the Robert Spencers. We also make distinctions between closed-minded and open-minded views of, of Islam. And so you don't have to agree with Islam or accept the religion as your own to be in alliance with Muslims. So there, there's some nuance there. Um, and, and the word definitely does get pushed back. The thing that I share with people is that my understanding of why the word has come into use is because leaders and activists years ago said, we need a way to talk about what is happening to mm-hmm. Islam and Muslims, that we, we can't challenge the problem if we can't name it. And so mm-hmm. they looked at words like homophobia, like anti-Semitism, to see sort of how much weight they had started to carry. And so Islamophobia was developed as a result of that. It comes under fire from anti-Muslim activists who will say, you know, phobia implies irrational fear and our fear of Muslims is rational. It does also come under fire from some on the left as well as some inside the Muslim community who will say, well, you know, the the word doesn't pull well or it, you know, it oversimplifies the problem. And my response and CARE's response to that has been, it's a word that has caught on. Um, It's being used by academics, by elected officials, by media professionals. Uh, I don't think that anybody claims that it is a perfect word, whether we were going to call it anti-Muslim bigotry or anti-Muslim sentiment or Islamophobia. None of those alone would ever capture the experience of the community and what's happening. The idea, again, is just to create a word that facilitates the conversation so we don't have to stop and spell out every piece of it every time we're talking about it. Go ahead. I was going to say, like... is the um, the genesis of the, of the word or the use uh, uh, come about like in a post nine eleven sort of uh, environment? At least as I understand it, yeah. it is a newer word. So mm-hmm. when exactly it was created, I'm not sure. Right. But you know, in the last twelve years, we've seen, more currency, we've seen yeah. a lot of focus on it. We've seen, for example, UC Berkeley take it on, which has really I think helped. Um, add to that conversation that there's the Islamophobia Research uh, and Documentation Project at UC Berkeley. CARE has created an Islamophobia department. And and none of this is to imply that these problems didn't exist beforehand, Mm -hmm. but that the community's own approach to the problems continues to evolve. Right. So... So, I th- and Pervez brought up nine eleven. I think we can certainly use that as sort of a pivot point in that that falls right in the middle just about of CARE's history. Mm-hmm. Uh, what how did 9-11 change the focus or the direction, if at all, of, of what the organization is trying to do? Sometimes I ramble when I answer this question because I don't know that there's a succinct answer to that. Pre-9-11, CARE's focus was empowering American Muslims, amplifying the, the Muslim community's voice, and, and filling in the gaps where there was civil rights work that needed to be done. There were eight CARE chapters pre-9-11. In the years that followed, CARE grew so fast that it could not scale, I, I, one would say, right? They went from eight to 32 in, I believe, about four years. And that's why today the number is something under 32, is that that immediate growth was not sustainable. Um, but the other thing that I think has happened post 9-11 that is to the benefit of the organization. And whenever I say that, I, or whenever I say anything that's positive in the last 12 years, I always say that's not to say that 9-11 was not a tragedy. It of course was and should be condemned and, you know, all of that, that standard stuff, right? Is that this isn't to say that, that, that was good, but rather in looking at the silver linings of civil rights, if there are any, um, one is that it has forced care to focus its work. So one of, and and that's not to say that this is a complete job or that, you know, that we have fully succeeded in that, but one of the things that CARE sometimes struggles with uh, as both an asset and a challenge is that people turn to CARE for a lot of things, Um, everything from, from family law and immigration problems when 
those necessarily might, might not necessarily be civil rights issues to calling us when someone needs food or, or needs medical assistance or, you know, a reporter has a question about something unrelated altogether, but people don't know how to interact with um, the media. And so following 9-11, because there was this huge need for civil rights work, but also because a number of Muslim organizations started to grow all at the same time, CARE had to look internally and say, well, how do we specialize, right? Like, how do we make our work unique and stand out, right? How do we, and, and how do we not reinvent the wheel? If someone down the street is doing something really great, then maybe I don't need to be doing that. Maybe I can better use my resources if I'm focusing, right? If I, if I do 20 things, I'm not going to do any of them well. If I do five, I might do them really well. And so it, it's, I think, helped us in that direction. And that's why you've seen sort of this the spate of hiring attorneys in care over the last few years where we've said like, this is really a priority for us. It's important for us to be able to answer those calls and provide common and, and a core competency versus the work of other organizations, which is it's, it's, it's uh, I'm really glad you went there because one of the questions I had for you was where, you know, where does sort of like, or in, in terms of arranging organizations in my mind and just being involved in, in, in various Muslim organizations, I think one of the one of the challenges is is that Muslims organizations spread themselves too thin, uh, trying to be a one stop shop for everything. So, where do you see the work of, of, of say care beginning and ending versus say uh, you know other organizations that are there within the Muslim community, names like ING and uh, Muslim Advocates right here in the Bay Area, both of those, MPAC, but also MPAC the Muslim Political yeah. Action Committee, Muslim Political Action Committee, uh, which I think it's worth noting also that. Dr. Maher Hatut is, 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 is taken ill, one of the uh, sort of tireless advocates and you know, mm-hmm. uh, leaders of that community. Giants, That's yeah. right, one of our community's giants. Who's, so you know, we, we pray for his well-being. Um, but, uh, yeah, so where do you sort of see yeah, care in, in that landscape? Um, so I, it's a tricky question right. and one that, that sometimes our community members will ask us. And one of the things that I always want to be mindful of is that I, I – maybe one of the better qualified people to talk for my organization uh, relative to people from other organizations. I am not qualified to talk about their organizations. And so keeping that in mind, right, that I'm qualified to talk about Karen and and that's about it. um, That one of the things or a couple of things that I, I believe make care special. And this is why I I come to work here. Mm -hmm. The first is that care prides itself on being community funded and community driven. So our boards, our board members come directly from within the communities we serve and care offices across the country, um, our own included in the Bay area are over 90% entirely community funded. So that's the person that gives us $5 a month and the person that maybe gives us a lot more than that, but that we really pride ourselves on, on that. And as a result of that, our agendas are set by the community. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I talk about how we, in the last 12 years have really focused our work on direct legal services, and there are other things like, like doing better media work, like working with youth to develop empowered leaders, that's all community driven. So it's one of the things I do really appreciate about our organization. The other thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that the idea of, of building specialization or focus is one that, that continues to evolve as, right. as, as other organizations around us evolve, because we're not doing it in a vacuum. Right. Right. So well, specifically right here in the Bay area, right. really you become this almost like an incubator, not even knowing the genesis uh, and the roots of, uh, of care in, in right. local or being local to the Bay area, that the Bay area really serves as an incubator for these Muslim right. organizations, specifically two of the ones that we mentioned earlier, ING and, uh, and Muslim advocates. So right. yeah, um, the thing, the other thing doesn't I would say is vacuum, that like you said. care maintains um, a level of flexibility. So for example, and, and I love ING as an example, cause they're a great, they're, they're partner organization and one that, you know, we, I think we, we, we attempt to mutually support each other's work. Um, I'm also a certified ING speaker. Um, so with that in mind... And, and it's, it's worth clarifying, ING is oh, the yes. Islamic yeah. Networks yeah. Group. Right. And they've been around... About 20 years now. So they actually celebrated their 20th anniversary this year. They're, they're one year older than CARE. Wow. Okay. Um, and they, again, not, not claiming to speak for the organization, but they do um, cultural competency trainings and you know and education about Islam and Muslims um, in a wide uh, spectrum of of settings for sort of classrooms, law enforcement, um, healthcare. And the reason I, I, I look to ING as an example in this conversation is we have care chapters that do that work in other places. Mm-hmm. So in, in Michigan, in Philadelphia, in Arizona, in Florida, where the care chapters have developed that competency and maybe that work is not happening at the same rate that it happens in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, a few years ago, we said to ourselves, you know, it makes no sense for two organizations that are both small, that are both community-driven and community-funded, 
to do the same work. Because if that's their core competency, they're going to do it better than us. And if our, if, if they attempted to do legal services, then we might do that better than them. And so for that reason, we've, you know, we've developed a respectful space where if, for example, we are working with a school because there's a civil rights violation, our entry point there is someone called us for help, needed assistance, needed um, advocacy as they navigated their rights. They needed a representative in that regard. And when we get to the place of, well, what does the school do to fix the problem? Mm-hmm. One, of the prob- one of the solutions education. is cultural competency Correct. and education. education right. In that case, we turn them to ING, right? And so there we've developed a really complementary relationship. Um, there, I think there there is and will at times still be overlap. So Muslim advocates and the Muslim Public Affairs Council both do policy advocacy work. CARE also does policy advocacy work. I would argue that that's an arena where more voices, more people, more bodies is actually a good thing. Yeah. So what now, now let's, let's start looking at the intersection where you decide that care is an organization that you want to be a part of and that you can, uh, hopefully benefit and can benefit from you. Uh, 2009 is, is when you join care. So, so what's, what's the lead up to that? And, and how does that end up happening? Sure. So, um, You've already told the audience how old I am. Um, so no. with that in mind, um, I was I was 17 when 9/11 happened, and I grew up in a very practicing Muslim household. Like I tell people, we went to the masjid six days a week, and some weeks we got a day off. So you know, but otherwise, like we went every day, Quran class, Sunday school, everything. But we didn't do Muslim activism. And I think that might have just been the result of being in a smaller community. Um, The first time I went to a protest was in college, which given Mm -hmm. how many protests I went to in college, um, a lot, it's surprising that I started in college and not sort of that I didn't grow up going to protest. So you say small community. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you. you, You're not native to the Bay Area then? No, I'm I'm from Southern California. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I I moved up here for law school. And so, yeah, so I don't have like this this relationship with with the Muslim community, with activism, with anything of that sort. But I'm 17 when 9-11 happens. It's like I'm a freshman in college. Um, And, you know. Here in the Bay Area? No, still still in Southern California. California. And and I'm, you know, we're we're in California. We're blessed. There are definitely some crazy here, but other it's not proportionally. It's probably a little bit right, less, right? exactly. But I still, you know, I, I had the experience of the anti-war rallies as we were going into Iraq, and people saying go back home. And I remember my parents' fear about me going to school and like going out and about with my headscarf on, um, you know, advising us to stay in, like things of that sort. So I remember that, and so my first interactions with care were in that era when things hmm. were. I think insane is an understatement, sure. right? Is that was, was that your first awareness of care? Yes. It, yeah, okay. I, that, that I that I recall my first awareness of care is post nine okay. eleven, um, and that makes sense. I mean, there there was an LA office. Um, it, it is also about fifteen to sixteen years old. Right. But it, how we still deal with questions of how many people know what care is and, and what care does um, today, right? Where where care has this many offices and has been around for nearly two decades. But I, I still meet Muslims who don't know, and wow. so it doesn't surprise me that if I grew up in a small community that I, I didn't. But um, I went to to college. Just you know, not not very far from our LA office, which was and, and still is one of our biggest offices uh, in the country. And so their executive director at the time would speak on college campuses, and you know, and I, I really appreciated his commitment to to the efforts of the Muslim community. So I interned there in two thousand four. Okay. It was a very bad intern. I didn't finish my hours, and I was generally multitasking. Um, but it's because <laughs> I was doing MSA work. Right. And so MSA was, being the the Muslim Student, Student Association, Association. Yes, for, yeah. Uh, the college um, So I did that, and then um, and so I've always had a relationship with the organization. Uh, at that time, we were looking at questions of um, of watch lists, of travel watch lists, right? Mm-hmm. Of what happens when people want to get on a plane. And, and so it's funny that how much has changed, and yet not not at all mm-hmm. in the last decade, as people are still dealing with those issues. But in 2004, those were very new issues, and, right. and we were still trying to figure them out. Um, I came to law school. I knew that I wanted to do social justice work. I always thought that I would do employment discrimination work. Uh, mm-hmm. It made sense to me to be a American Muslim lawyer who wore a headscarf and did social justice work in, in sort of the mainstream American community. I thought that you don't, you don't have to do Islamic education by, by doing explicit Islamic mm-hmm. education, mm-hmm. right? That like simply providing services to people who need them is itself a form of, of, of giving back. Sure. And, 
And at the same time, I graduated from law school in 2009. I think that was the last year anyone thought it was a good year to go to law school. <laughs> it was a terrible situation. Um, yeah. As a 2008 yeah, law school graduate, I, yeah, I think that was the year, I guess, yeah, sorry. Where, the, where the market tanks. But it adapt, <laughs> right. So 2008 is where people who yeah. had the, the job offers actually had job offers rescinded. Right. Um, really? Oh, yeah. This was a big thing for wow. people who wanted to go into private practice. Like you would work for two years at a firm, you'd really right. build it up and they'd offer you something at the end of two years. And, and, and it's a six figure salary and like some security. And in your third year, yeah. you're you're losing that offer, and so. But yeah. what, what happened? I mean, the economy. The economy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and no one wants to pay like starting salary for these I mean, six figures, right? Like yeah. I, I might make six figures in twenty years. Like six figures is is a right big deal in that school. economy, yeah. right? Okay, exactly. Exactly. Like you could be twenty five. Uh-huh. Wow. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Those of us that are not private practice attorneys dream of these things. <laughs> and so, so they lost right. their job. And 25 and six figures in a city like Houston or Atlanta, right? Yeah. I mean, is Living large. Living large. To say the, to say the least. least. <laughs> right. To say the least. Um, yeah. But like you said, I mean, having job, having these major firms, big, big, big law, as they say, rescind offers. I mean, that all, yeah, it's just wow. uh, no longer offering partner track uh, positions to new associates. The whole market changes. And, and well, so Zahra and I, not knowing that you graduated in 09, I mean, we're a part of that whole that whole uh, class, if, as it were. The other thing that happens as a result of this is when you wanted to do nonprofit work, the other you do the same thing that you do if you want to do uh, the big firm work, is you build up a resume of nonprofit work, right? Like, So I right. worked at a nonprofit my first summer, my first fall, my second summer. I mm. did the clinics. Like, I did all of that. I also had a social justice resume. Like, I, I'd done all that in college. Did you clerk in year two? Like, did, or did, did you were you like a I did. Associate? I did an extern. Externship. Uh, an externship at a nonprofit. Gotcha. Sorry, year so, two. Yeah, not year one, right? So that was always sort of your Yeah, yeah. Focus. So I always wanted that's, to do that. I always did employment. Right. But the other thing that, that really that the market really changed yeah. was so when the firms rescinded the, the $160,000 offers, they said, well, we'll give you 50 to 80,000 if you go work at a nonprofit. So, mm-hmm. so it was like the nonprofits all of a sudden had all this free labor from all these people who didn't really care about, well, who, who didn't plan their lives to care about. There, you, there you go. <laughs> who didn't prioritize. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so all the, the kids who had were, were in trouble. Our, our commencement speech felt like a, a, a sort of a, a consolation prize. Like, don't worry guys, you, you, you'll find work. Like it was, <laughs> I so like that. Yeah. So, you manage. Yeah. And so speech. at that point you throw out your priorities and you apply to any job you can get. Sure. Um, and luckily for me, and, and you know, of course we plan and we plan and Allah always plans better. Yeah. Um, I would not have thought to, to work at care. Like it was just not something that was on my to-do list and, sure. um, and they were hiring and I needed a job. Like I had literally moved half my stuff back to Southern California. So oh. I moved up to the San Francisco Bay Area to go to law school. For law school. Right. UC Davis. Uh, UC, oh, sorry. UC San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. And I just I, moved, I started to move everything back. I was like, okay, like this is it. I'm going to go move back with my parents, um, take the bar, and be a 25 year old living at home. And that was that was the. It still is. People still have to do oh, that. Yeah, and too. fortunately, right. um, Care was hiring, and I had a relationship with the organization. Mm-hmm. Um, they were excited about the fact that I would have a law degree and that that I would be a lawyer, um, and that I that you know, and I was excited about the fact that I wasn't going to be behind a desk writing briefs all day. Like that was never something I wanted to do. That I'd get to do community organizing in my work. Um, and I still get to do a little bit of employment discrimination work. So, you know, things worked out. Does that period mark a time in CARES history where uh, the focus turns to hiring a lot more attorneys, like you said, in the last few years? So right, that would put it right around 2009, correct? Correct. So when I was hired, um, I was the second attorney in California. And today there are somewhere between like five and six attorneys in California, um, as well as a number of attorneys on our board. So we've, we've looked at increasing our our relationship uh, with lawyers in, in various ways mm-hmm. in that way. We also, we, I think the first time we ever had law clerks was in California was 2010. And so now all of our offices across the state, you know, we'll, we'll pick up law clerks. So it's, it's amazing. Like in the summer you can, to think that in 2009, I, there was no attorney, there was one attorney in this office and that, and after she left, I came in and now mm-hmm. in the summer you'll have two attorneys and two to three law clerks here as well right. as law clerks in Sacramento. It's, it's really amazing. So, so you, you come on board and I, I do find it interesting. You, you always had it in your mind to move towards kind of a social justice mm-hmm. track. So this, this was not a sudden paradigm Correct. shift, uh, which, which is worthwhile. I think, um, what, what was the steepest learning curve you had when you came here? What, what surprised you once you got in here and got a sense of the work that you would be doing? Um, 
a good question. I think there are two things that, that maybe really surprised me. The first was understanding and realizing how much our community organizations, not just CARE, but all of them, really rely on the community for, for their support. Like, I love my mom. Uh, she's a care supporter. But one of the things that she said to me that, that surprised me, but also I think reflects how a lot of people feel about our organizations is, she said, you know, I never thought care needed money. Like, it just didn't uh, occur to her. And, and it was, you know, the, a lot of the staff walk around in suits. I mean, like, the people that see that never know that they're discount suits or that they're bought in bulk <laughs> or, you know, it's the same suit three days in a row because that's what you do when you work at a nonprofit. But that, like... It just, it never, and, and that it was not a reflection of her not appreciating Kara's work. It was a, how many people are we touching and conveying that we need their help, that, that they help us help them, right? Mm -hmm. And when I got in and, you know, now she's hearing like the inside track on, on all of the fundraising drama um, and all of that work, she, you know, now she gives and, and she encourages other people to give and, and she gets it, right? And so that I think was really surprising for me as someone who was a consumer and maybe not um, a supplier of, mm -hmm. of Muslim organizations is sure. just that every dollar matters and getting people to just open their wallets makes such a huge difference, right? That for us at CARE, it's really important. Uh, we say that your access to justice should never be conditioned on your ability to pay for that justice, right? That, I don't know, it, and Pervez, you're an attorney, Zaki, I don't know if you've ever hired a private attorney, but like... I've not needed to. So. Yeah, so, so fortunately, and so surround yourself with Pervez and, and, and me and others, and then until you won't, um, we're happy to, right. you know, to do favors. But like, you know, I, I was recently looking at, at the rates that attorneys charge, and it's like, it starts at 125 an hour if you're hmm. lucky. But yeah, like I, I don't feel lucky. Right? Yeah, right, like 600, 700 an hour. There's no way, like a, a whole day of work. I mean, you're talking about like someone's rent check. Yeah. And so, but to see that when someone turns around and makes that donation to enable care to do that work, that we can then provide it and pay it forward for, for free for, for so many others. So that was, I think, one of the hardest things to learn and, and continues to be um, a challenge in our work. One that we're grateful for that the community continues to support us, but we're always trying to figure out how more, how do we can, how do we share with people that when the FBI is on your front doorstep, that you should not have to think can I afford 125 an hour, right? That you should just know that there is, that, that the community has taken care of you and that you can call and, and get that help for free. Um, I think the other thing that, that maybe was a steep learning curve was the types and extent of civil rights violations that the Muslim community faces. As someone who, I would say that I grew up fairly privileged, mm -hmm. right? That I'm, my, my parents are immigrants and yet were able to send me to law school. Um, I graduated with a manageable amount of debt that I, you know, I've never had to do the working four jobs to pay rent deal. Um, my parents are both citizens. So I was born and raised, um, here. Like I, and I haven't been visited by the FBI. I haven't been arrested and harassed. I don't recall ever facing employment discrimination. At best I faced school bullying and, and that I did face and that's pretty standard, but overall a place of privilege. And, a lot of what we see here surprises me. And mm. even to this day, like you don't, yeah, you, you think that the person that comes to work for care knows what they're getting themselves into. And, and you don't, like you don't think that you're going to hear from people whose bank accounts are being closed or who are citizens stuck in another country because they can't get on, on an airplane because the government is interested in them. Yeah. Muslims who've taken lie detector tests with the FBI without an attorney present because they didn't know any better and they didn't know who they could call, right? Students who've had not just other peers at school bully them, but their teachers, right? Like that, it's just, it's not the, the type of thing that, that I think everyday American Muslims realize is, is happening. And I don't say that to, to and I, I try to be careful about not saying that to paint a dismal picture. Like, I don't think it's all bad, but I think it can be really surprising. And, and when you're doing what we do here, where we provide services in a number of different areas, you're having to learn things really quickly. Like you're not, and you're learning a lot of different things. I was just going to say, like, as someone involved in the trenches, as it were, and, and really on the ground, um, and, and, and seeing these type of cases on a daily or frequent basis, just from your own perspective, where do you see um, the, the civil rights struggles that Muslims have in light of the uh, greater civil rights struggles that other minorities have, in, have had in this country? I mean, one of the things that you, that you hear... And that I've thought a lot about personally is that, you know, well, you know, 
uh, other minorities have faced this prior to the Muslim community, whether it was the Irish when they first immigrated here or the Italians, certainly the African-American community, you know, the Jewish community, and now it's just happens to be the turn of the Muslims. Is this sort of a, you know, a coming of age that all minorities go through in in America, you know, given the civil rights history of the, of the country? Or is there something more unique to the Muslim experience? And if so, what would you think? What, what makes that experience unique? I mean, that's a big question, but I mean, I think that really, I would love to get your thoughts on that. So I struggle with, with this idea of comparing oppression, mm. right? Hmm. Like that Sorry. someone's oppression is greater or lesser than mine. Um, it's funny. It comes up sometimes when we talk about the the issues that that prisoners face, mm-hmm. because when you tell someone who has who is familiar with what happens in Syrian prisons, that in the United States we're fighting against solitary confinement, which is not a form of physical torture; it's a form of psychological torture. Like they, they're like, well, it's not so bad. And my thought is, I don't know. Like I don't know if I would rather sit in a jail cell for ten years by myself, right, mm-hmm. and be fed through a hole in the wall, never see like the real sunlight ever again, or have my my fingernails pulled out and be released the next day. Like, I, 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 how do you how do you compare that True. that oppression? And so I struggle with that with this because a number of communities have faced things that maybe are and feel far more severe than what American Muslims are facing today. And at the same time, I guess if you change the means of oppression, does that make oppression okay, right? Like, just because you're not interning 100,000 American Muslims the way you interned 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, does that make the impact of Guantanamo any less? Does it make it any less wrong? Mm -hmm. Um, And so is it the American Muslim turn um, to to be hazed as as maybe as, as Americans? One would say yes, uh, but it seems to have been going on for a while, right? The right. anti-Muslim sentiment, that civil rights violations, these things are not pre-9-11. I mean, things are post, not post-9-11, post 9/11 correct? Right. They're, they're a pre-9-11 issue. I mean, one of the things that I learned later as, as I did this work was that when George Bush Sr. was running for president in 2000, American Muslim leaders met with him and talked to him about racial fro- profiling. George, George Bush Jr. Here. Sorry, Junior. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, dating yeah, yeah. myself. Yeah, right. When when Junior ran for president, right. they met with That's him. They right. talked to him about racial profiling. They talked to him about uh, secret evidence. Correct. And, and, and he, one of the reasons yeah. why, I mean, because I, yeah. a number of Muslim organizations endorsed his candidacy. Yeah. That's right. uh, we uh, couldn't because we were a 501c3, I but see. others. Right. Other organizations. Right. Yeah. I'm glad you made that point. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, for full transparency. Well, I, and I, mean, and I think it's it's fair to say that the Muslim vote was was voluminous enough in that case that it could very well have tipped the election. Given well, that in the Supreme Court. Well, sure, but but given the yes. the slim okay. number that it came down okay. to, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, and and I think that 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 is something that Muslims, a lot of people, maybe my generation of, of Muslims have have blamed our leaders for, like, well, it's our fault, and and then you sit down and you're like, well, no, like George Bush Jr. came down on the right side of on the correct side of racial profiling, sure. on the correct side right. of secret evidence when Al Gore and his camp wouldn't even meet with Muslims at that time. True. So these are True. problems that have been going on. So what? So we're not comparing oppression, but the thing that makes it maybe mm-hmm. unique is that. Mm-hmm. Well, two things. One, the Muslim community is not maybe as homogenous as some of the other communities that have been targeted, Mm -hmm. right? So it's both religious, it's ethnic, it's people who are no longer practicing, it's people who may look Muslim, it's Sikhs, right? Like there's this like ever growing group. Um, And and I think that 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 is itself, the only comparison I can think of is is maybe the LGBT community, Hmm. where number of different faiths, religions, ethnicities, etc. So it's very diverse. The other thing that I think is frightening is that a lot of times our targeting of groups is tied to, to wars, right? To, to foreign uh, affairs that when we're at war with the Japan and Germany, we're going to target those people when we're at war with, with, and, and this starts to change as we go into the cold war is that we're no longer at war with a country. We're at war with an idea. Right. Um, and with terrorism, we're not at war with even an idea. We're at war with a strategy and one that our country itself engages in pretty frequently. And so that is, I think what's most frightening is that, you can't even figure out who's going to suffer and who's going to be targeted. And there's no end in sight because, you know, you thought like, okay, we're going to conquer Iraq. Oh, wait, and we sort of did that. We're going to take Afghanistan. We sort of did that sort of, right. Um, we're going to kill Osama bin Laden. We did that. We got on Raul. Like, and, and still like every three weeks they're announcing another major terror arrest in some other country. And so it's never ending. And that's the thing that really scares me. True. So in, 
you know, I, I, I think it's, it's helpful here. And, and you sort of alluded to in broad strokes, some of the things you've dealt with. What, what are uh, some specific examples of the kinds of issues that you, you've, you've taken point on or that you've been involved in, in advocating for? Uh, because I, I think I think it might be helpful because we're we're talking about sort of Islamophobia or or discrimination in, in conceptual terms. I think it might be helpful to really put a, a fine point on it. Sure. So, well, I mean, you're right. When we talk about Islamophobia in, in bigger picture terms, it involves um, elected officials and media generally, you know, spewing um, anti-Muslim sentiment, and that that itself is problematic. And and I always explain that we, or I try to explain that what we deal with when we do the direct services part of our work is the ramifications of that, that it's not just that Peter King holds a hearing on, on Islam and Muslims or that a bunch of people on Fox news are opposing park 51, that that results in mosques across the country being opposed that when elected officials are, you know, encouraging law enforcement to surveil and treat as suspect the entire Muslim community, that means that hundreds of Muslims are being visited by the FBI at their homes, when families are consuming uh, bigoted media like Fox News, then of course their children are going to act out on the playground and you know and target the Muslim kid. And so, across the country, care offices each year um, take in and provide services to a pro- to something over two thousand complainants. Um, so that's you know American Muslims and people of other faiths who are mistaken for Muslim who are calling care offices for help each year. And those are just the people that are brave enough to call or maybe that know their rights and know where they can get help and, and do actually call. We we never treat these numbers as scientific because you can't quantify the people that aren't calling. Yeah. Um, in California alone, last year, our four offices took in um, over 850 complaints. Um, the largest category was employment discrimination. So people complaining that they are, that they are either being harassed at work because they're Muslim or not getting the accommodation that they're requesting, but they have a you know federal right to um, whether it's their headscarf or their beard because because they want to practice their religion in the workplace. The second category, and I think that for a while this was actually the largest category, is government violations of our civil liberties, and that's frightening because when when I need help or when something goes wrong, I want to be able to call law enforcement for help. I'm not going to do that if they're going to treat me as suspect, right? As, as a matter of building relationships and trust in the community, it is problematic when a large segment of the civil rights violations complained of are by the people that maybe are supposed to help protect us and help enforce our civil rights laws. So those things include um, travel delays and issues, right? A lot of people don't even complain about their travel issues anymore. It's sort of normal that it's going to take right. me another three hours to <laughs> get through. And that's not okay, right? Like that's, this goes back to that, the outreach and education piece is that we want to make sure that our community is not internalizing um, the violation of their civil rights. Um, we want, the, and at the same time, we don't want them to be scared. We want them to be indignant. We want them to be empowered, engaged, and, you know, and, and the right kind of angry um, to, to say, this is not okay, that I'm, that I'm an American more than that, that I'm a person. I, I, de- I deserve to be treated with respect. And so we encourage people to complain. Um, so airport issues, um, local police harassment. And then really the one that I think is most frightening is, is FBI visits, um, and, and questioning. I, you know, an experiment that I recommend to people who are like, well, I haven't been visited by the FBI is ask your family and friends. Mm-hmm. I would be surprised if everybody doesn't know at least one person who has been visited by the FBI. And our objective is to provide people with representation and, and protect them from those scenarios. Um, in the majority of cases, we see that where a person asserts their rights and gets legal counsel, that the FBI will actually leave them alone. And in the, I've been licensed since 2009, and since then, our office, uh, myself and the other attorney, um, have provided services to, I think, over 150 American Muslims in the Bay Area who have complained of FBI issues. We're one of a number of agencies that do it for free. And then there's a number of private attorneys. So of the 150 that we've done, I believe over 80 to 90% when the person asserts their rights and says, look, I've got an attorney. My attorney will call you. The attorney calls. The FBI is no longer interested in talking to them. Hmm. But in that minority of cases where people will, you know, not assert their rights, will think, well, if I, you know, I'm just nice, they'll think I'm a loyal and I cooperate. Cooperate, In those cases, the FBI is going to talk to them about their religion, about their politics. We've had people asked about Syria, Egypt, um, the Arab Spring, Palestine, who goes to your mosque? Like, who who prays with you? How do you feel about the oneness of God? How good is your Arabic? Like, things that law enforcement has no business right, right. asking wow. anybody. And that's 
really scary. And there have been a number of exposés by great folks like Trevor Aronson um, and others who've looked at, you know, the thousands of informants that are being used to target the, the Muslim community these days. And so that, like, that's just a snapshot through school bullying. Like, we had a student who, you know, who'll be... Uh, will be doing some, will actually be doing some public speaking on behalf of CARE um, and, and on this issue in, in coming days, who was told by her teacher, you know, if you don't be quiet, I'll tear that thing off your head uh, in reference to her headscarf. And this is a high school student in the Bay Area in California. And you just, you don't think that that's going to happen. And, and again, like we don't share these stories for the sake of people feeling sad or, or frightened. We, we really want people to feel the right kind of angry about right. it, that this is not okay. Well, and, and, you know, and you alluded to this a little bit, but, you know, when it, when it comes to, for example, being questioned by the FBI, you know, you'll have a lot of people say, well, if you've got nothing to hide, what's, why not, you know, and, and that notion of like asserting, uh, your privilege or what have you, uh, what is your response to that? I I mean, and, and maybe just to frame this, I know you teach, uh, know your rights workshops and things like that. Maybe you can Mm -hmm. give our listeners kind of a reader's digest version of what, of what, you advise people to do and, and the why behind that. So we, um, the reason that we talk to people about knowing their rights is because in the minority of cases where people don't assert their rights, we find that the consequences can be really severe. Um, I talk to Muslims who, you know, are sometimes surprised to learn that innocent people go to jail all the time. (laughs) Like, I I mean, I had this conversation with somebody recently. I thought, wait, like, have you not been paying attention to what's happened to other communities, (laughs) right? right? Like, did you not see what happened to Japanese Americans? And the reason I paused was because I was trying to pull up this thing that explains it in a Reader's Mm -hmm, Digest form. And so what we say is, it's as easy as one, two, three. Um, One, do not speak to to an FBI agent without a lawyer. Don't let them inside your home unless they show you a search warrant signed by a judge. Two, if they visit you, ask them to give you their business card. Take the card and tell them that the lawyer will contact you. And three, call CARE, the ACLU, the Asian Law Caucus, the National Lawyers Guild, or any of these other agencies for for free services. It really is that simple. The founders of this country made sure that we had in place very strong protections against unchecked law enforcement. Correct. That That's it. Like, this is not a Muslim problem. It is not a care thing. That this is a fundamental American value. That the government has no business in our homes without a search warrant. That our politics, our religion, our associations, none of that is the government's business. And, and that's what I always go back to is this is not a Muslim thing. That you don't prove your loyalty, you don't prove that you're a good Muslim, and not only that, you endanger yourself, right? How Whatever you may believe about innocent people not going to jail, the statistics will show, and any competent criminal defense attorney, Muslim or not, you know, Islamophobe or not even, will tell you that you should not talk to law enforcement without an attorney present. All of the attorneys I know would not talk to an to talk to law enforcement without an attorney. Right. If I were visited as an attorney who does this, I would call someone for help, right? right? So the statistics show that there's nothing to gain from speaking to law enforcement. The last thing that I'll say is that one of my colleagues always says that, you know, people fought and died for these rights. If you're going to give them up, if you're going to sacrifice them, you should ask what are you getting in exchange, right? <laughs> and knowing Good that point. the FBI is allowed to lie to you, um, that, that whatever they promise you or threaten you with, you can't really hold them to it, right? That it's your word against theirs and that they have a history of prosecuting, not just Muslims, but other minority communities. I wouldn't trust them if they told me I'd get something in exchange, right? Mm -hmm. That again, I always tell people that, that it can be a lot of different things. The two things to remember are, you know, you always have a right to an attorney and you always have a right to remain silent and that there's free help out there. If you're not sure, call help, right? Like, if you were diagnosed with cancer, if you found a lump somewhere, I would hope that you would not try to cut into it yourself, that you would call a doctor. I don't want to call the FBI a lump, like an unwanted lump, but you know, someone shows up at your door and you don't know who they are. Call for help. Like it just, it makes sense. Well, I mean, I I don't know what I wanted to sort of talk about. I know we've touched on this and, uh, which is um, Islamophobia and, and, and CARE's work within that context. But I wanted to kind of flesh out uh, 
more of the landscape that that, that care sort of works mm-hmm. in and, and operates in. And, and, and I think that you can't do that without talking about the naysayers and without talking about some of the um, criticisms that 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 come from you know, I guess channels that we would often, or that, that can be best described as the, the sort of usual suspects as far as mm-hmm. Islamophobia goes, but at the same time, just from people who don't know. Uh, I don't know if it was like if you wanted to add to that, but or, well, I, I mean, <laughs> did, yeah, but. no, I, I, well, I think, and and we can frame this in. You said certain channels, and I was uh, like, yes, the the proverbial fox in the hen house, if you will. But um, <laughs> which Zara, I would love to get her. <laughs> She's well, been as, in the lot in the fox's den, as it were, right? So yeah. So so you 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 talked with uh, Bill O'Reilly, and and uh, I mean that that must have been an interesting experience. I mean I. I, I'd love to get your take on that because because but, yeah, go ahead. We're, we're dealing with a media organization that I'm not going to say it's centered on driving home Islamophobia, but it's certainly not rushing to to sort of be like, no, no, Muslims are okay, right? So so there is sort of a counter narrative that that you had to present mm-hmm. when you appeared on on O'Reilly, and I believe this was fairly soon after you started working for Care. Yeah, so so I feel, I feel like that was a kind of a trial, trial by, by fire, fire yeah. right? <laughs> but if you could, though, so because I think what what what, what where, where where Bill O'Reilly is coming from, right, and and his talking points, uh, you know, apropos right. usage, but um, you know, stem from this larger narrative that it, that 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 comes from not only Bill O'Reilly's of the world, but others about care and and the fact that care was a you know, unindicted co- co- co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation case in 2007 and, and all those things. So I wish I, what I wanted you to do was really sort of paint the work that Kara does and, and in your involvement in that broader context, but, but really flesh out some of that. Sure. Because I sure. Think, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, and I think that would be helpful yeah. to maybe contextualize some of the prominent anti-care critiques that are out mm-hmm. there. Right. Because yeah. I think because to, our, they are out to our listeners, even those who are not familiar with care specifically or the work that care does, which I think that the discussion thus far has been really informative in that regard, have probably heard of care sure. uh, just by virtue of hearing its name dropped in various media outlets. And yeah. unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, that's not always in the, in, in the well, most. And it's usually affixed life. with right. unindicted co-conspirators. <laughs> yes, so. or, or, or Hamas supporters. There you go. I mean, like, exactly. just, to, just to be right. very transparent. No, yeah, that's absolutely. usually what it's called. And, yeah. and, 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 and yeah, some, of its, some of its founders and board members have, have, have sort of been this quote unquote light, lightning rod of criticism. Again, rightfully, wrongfully so. And, and so I'd really like for yeah, your, sure. your thoughts on all of that. Sure, sure. So, you know, two things to know about prior to sort of the larger controversial yeah. issues. Um, I wish I could take credit for, for having talked to or, or met with Bill O'Reilly. I actually had his, his substitute guest host, Laura Ingram. Uh, so oh, even though, better. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so though my claim to fame is, is the Bill O'Reilly show, I, I didn't actually get to interact with Well, you went yeah. mono, or, well, I, maybe there's a better word, but mono, person, mono with person. another attorney, right? I mean, she She's is an, an attorney, attorney. yeah. As, Huh. She's Laura Ingram's an attorney, as is, uh, what's her, the other, uh, Sean, Sean Hannity, she's always on. She's a U Michigan grad. <laughs> okay. So, so there is that. Treason. The one she wrote, Treason. Ann Coulter? Ann Coulter is an attorney. Really? Yes. Wow. Well, there you go. Yeah. A U Mish grad, which as, yeah, yeah. you know, for those, yeah, who, I mean, this is pedigree. Wow, yeah, yeah, no, it is. Um, so that's the first thing that I, I did want to clarify. And then the other thing I wanted to clarify was, you know, I, I do always want to keep in, in mind that the right-wing anti-Muslim sentiment is is almost less scary than left-wing anti-Muslim sentiment, mm-hmm. right? Okay. So um, the example is that the people, so some of the people that really uh, cheered for the war in Afghanistan were left-wing activists who thought that we needed to go in there and liberate those women. Um, and, and so that, that's almost worse, right? Sure. Uh, uh, the joke, is, actually, I, I can't even, it's a, there's a really vulgar comparison that we had in, in college, but like, you know, with, with Republicans, at least, you know, it's coming, mm. like at mm-hmm. least they're in your face about it. Yeah. Right. But with the left wing, sometimes it, like these more subtle forms of Islamophobia, oh, sure. are uh, from Bill scary. O'Reilly, uh, Richard, uh, Bill, uh, excuse me, Bill Maher, mm. uh, right. Uh, exactly. Richard Dawkins. Right, right. right. Those people, right? Like, yeah. you don't know what's coming. And those are, I think, still even far left. Like, I, I mean, within the Democratic Party, you see Islamophobia sometimes, right? Just a couple of years ago, there was a, uh, a primary race in Sacramento um, where a they were trying, where a Democratic uh, candidate was trying to unsee a longstanding right-wing Republican. And when the right-wing Republican went on attack on the Democrat, he said, you know, you took money from a care leader. And, and the Democrat caved immediately. Hmm. Sent the money back, like would not. This was a Arab Muslim Middle Eastern Democrat. This was this was a 
brown skinned Democrat in California who couldn't take the heat and, and, you know, who, who turned his back on the community. And so well, I, I want to highlight Clinton, that. I don't yeah. know if it was care related, yes. but remember when Gave she was running back for her senate, ago. senatorial uh, seat in New York, uh, she was shamed into giving money back by her opponent. So right. because this, it came this from would Muslim. have been 2006, probably. So. When she ran for re-election, though? probably. Yeah, yeah I, I don't remember, but yes, I remember that story as well. And so that was not a care piece, but yeah, exactly, it was like the same thing. And so I always want to put that out there because as yeah. much as we make fun of Fox News, like they're not the only problem. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, um, one of the probably two two major I think controversies about yeah. care. The first is is the Holy Land Foundation trial and and what that meant. And you know, I was in college when this happened, so definitely not attempting to explain it in legalese, but. Many of your listeners may not even remember the Holy Land Foundation. Um, it was, and, and maybe they do, and I hope that they do, um, because we stand tall. We stand tall because we stand on, on the shoulders of the giants that came before us. The Holy Land Foundation was the largest American Muslim charity just Correct. 12, 13 years ago. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm from Texas, and I grew up in Texas. I mean, Holy Land was. I mean, they were based. Right, so they, they were based. They, they, were, they were based in Dallas, in northern right. United. Like so, Texas. so there, and just to, just to give added context, they, this organization. Large their, some charity, and their purpose was to to feed orphans abroad. I think primarily in Palestine. all over the world. And yeah, I think so. Primarily Palestine. I think there was a lot of focus on Palestine, mm-hmm. um, but I, I don't think it was exclusively Palestine. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, and they their offices were raided. I think in December of two thousand one. Um, yes. It was like over a million dollars in assets seized and frozen by the U.S. government, like everything. And and you know I. I have never personally witnessed a law enforcement raid aside from, you know, what I see on television, but from what I hear from our clients, from what I hear from the community is like, it is not the kind of thing that, that anyone should ever have to experience, particularly not people doing social justice work. Mm-hmm. Um, it took them until 2007 to even conclude the first trial. Um, and the, the, in 2007, I believe that the result was actually the, the case that um, a number of charges were dropped and that yes. they were, there, there was acquittals and then that the, there were some, I think, uh, hung juries or mistrials or something, right? I, yeah, it's and, been a while, too. I don't remember the exact details, but I think you're right. Yeah. And the government brought, the, brought so the government refiled the charges, right. made some additional changes, and in 2008, um, I think, found five of its leaders guilty of, uh, I think it was material support that they were actually found guilty of. Is that Does that sound right to you? It does. Um, and for those that are not familiar with the material support laws today, um, when we think of material support, um, you know, when, when lay people think of material support, we think of um, funding terrorists, right? Like sending money to terrorists. And, and that, of course, is itself a problematic question because what is a terrorist? Who defines a terrorist? Um, and and how does that shift? And sort of there's all of those things. But there's also this other like sort of more frightening thing around material support where if I am, hypothetically, if there is a terrorist organization that provides a number of other services like charity, like feeding the orphans, like you know hospitals, like education, if I fund any of that work, right? Like again, legitimate nonviolent work, I could be accused of material support because the idea is, well, if I give them money for food, then they have more of their own money for terrorism, right? Like it's, it's just, it's so ridiculous. Um, and I think that the, the seminal case on this is, is what humanitarian law project, uh, versus Holder. Um, and, and in that case, as, as I recall, again, not, not at all my area of expertise, but as I recall, the material support was training in nonviolence, so if mm. I'm training terrorists on how to be nonviolent, mm. I am in violation of the law. So um, that madness aside, um, the Holy Land Foundation, um, the only thing that was ever proven really about them was that they sent money to uh, what were called zakat committees um, run by Hamas. Okay. Um, two things to note is that these are the same zakat committees that USAID sent money to. So our own government was sending money to these committees. And then the other thing is that all of the money that they are accused of sending was sent before Hamas was labeled a terrorist organization. Um, one of the most frightening things that emerged, two frightening things that emerged from the trial, the first was um, the use of secret witnesses. So the government actually provided um, what were believed to be like Israeli um, experts who could testify on Hamas being terrorists. And there was no information provided about these witnesses. So like as Americans, we have a right to question our accusers. We have a right to, you know, to sort of do that in open court and hear no background information. You couldn't ask their names. You couldn't ask what they, what they knew. And like, and some of the testimony was ridiculous. It was like, I can smell Hamas. And I was like, really? Like people are, are in jail for the rest of their lives because this expert who you can't question can smell Hamas, right? Like someone who has never seen or interacted with the organization. And mm-hmm. the sentences are really 
scary. I mean, um, yeah. I think it's the board chair that is serving 65 years in a communication management unit. And uh, communication management units are modern-day solitary confinement. There are two facilities in the United States that were built um, many have argued exclusively to house Muslims. There's a couple of what they call balancers. So um, literally, I think it's like less than 20% of the inmates are not Muslim. Sure. Um, and those are the balancers. So that, you know, they could never be accused of, of discriminatory wow. practice. But I love the term. It's very Orwellian right, right. communication right. management. Exactly. It's, they're, not, um, they're not, I think they're like allowed like incredibly restricted time out altogether. So they don't get to go out. They don't get to see family. They don't get to see media. They like, it's, just, it's crazy. And hmm. And one of the things that I always remind myself is if our community had been more active in speaking out against solitary confinement when black and brown people were and continue to, to suffer that in, in mainline prisons, would it have come to what it is today, right? So we had solitary confinement, people in regular prisons being thrown in what was called the hole. Yeah, right. After that, you had uh, the supermax prisons, which I think is where Imam Jamil Alamin is, um, yes. who's an African-American leader from COINTELPRO era who uh, many have said is falsely accused of, of, of killing someone. And so he's in a supermax prison. Communication management units are worse than that. Wow. Um, it's considered a form of psychological torture. And what his only crime was sending money to, to Palestine um, to, to literally feed children. Um, he must be over 50 now. So it is the rest of his life. The U.S. Supreme Court has refused to review the case. And so we don't know what will happen next. So that's that. How, why is that not random and how does it relate to care? There's a evidence rule, um, one that I barely remember and, and hated uh, memorizing, <laughs> about um, about hearsay. And the way I explain it is if Zahra is on trial for something, something that Zaki said out of court about what I am in trial for cannot be used against me in court unless Zaki conspired with me to commit the crime that I'm gotcha. put on trial for, right? It's weird. It's a little convoluted. Okay. And so... Okay. What the government did was uh, they yeah. published a list of 246, I think, unindicted co-conspirators. And what that permitted them to do, should they choose to later, mind you, it was also against their own pra- policies and practices. They have, uh, there's an internal practice about not publishing lists of unindicted co-conspirators. But what they wanted to do was bring in statements from those 240-something leaders and organizations to use at trial against the Holy Land Foundation. Without enough evidence to actually indict, bring charges against, or even accuse those 240 of anything. And and a a case of once bitten, twice shy. I mean, this idea of being an unindicted co-conspirator also came, I mean, within the context of the Muslim community, was after the 1993 World Trade Center bombings and the trial of uh, uh, Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman where you had a number of Muslim organizations, mainstream Muslim organizations, as well as Muslim leaders, Mm -hmm. uh, some of whom are right here in the Bay Area, who were named as quote-unquote unindicted co-conspirators for much of the same reasons that Zahra was talking about. So it, it as a layperson, it sounds like a way to cast aspersions yes. while, while giving yourself the ability to say, I'm not, right? You know, right? But, Absolutely. But because the, the phrase is so loaded. Yeah, because most people are going to hear co-conspirator. Yes, um, they're exactly. not really and, and indicted. Yes. Right, exactly, <laughs> right. right. It's, it's sort of like why, why they say that you should never say... Um, uh, Muslims condemn terrorism because really people only hear Muslims and terrorism in that <laughs> sentence. Everything else gets lost. Okay. Um, that's not to say that we don't condemn right, terrorism. Right, right. We do, but that there's a, there's a better way to phrase yes, it. Yes, exactly. Sure. Right. Um, and so with this, it's people hear co-conspirator. And, and the other thing is, it's not like lawyers have a hard time explaining it to each other, right? Like I, I did yeah. struggle through that attempt at an explanation. Like I didn't. Even I think you did it very well. Yeah, yeah you, you did. did. You did. But, I, but yeah. But for the most no part, it's not. Because... You know, it, it, it doesn't. It, so. It, the thing that, and, and this was everybody, um, anybody, so everybody who was anybody in the Muslim community in the 1990s showed was, up on this list. That's right. Um, you know, it You're was talking Kher, Isna, people. Imam Siraj Wahaj, like uh, individual leaders within these organizations, like everybody. Imam Martin huh. Muhammad was Yeah, a, I mean, just, right. You yeah. might even know it better than I do. Like, no, no, no. So, so what, well, I mean, what, what prompted this sort of uh, a witch hunt, if you will, against the, the Holy Land Foundation? I mean, I don't think we could ever know for sure, mm-hmm. right? Like, one of the things that 
individuals who are visited by the FBI ask us is why me? And I'm like, we don't know. And, yeah. and we could make ourselves crazy wondering why. I mean, but I mean, I, I think there are you, theories. You, exactly. Yes. And, and you mentioned, and then, you know, we're not going to make this show about, you know, various conspiracy theories or how these things all sort of come <laughs> together. But, but, you know, you talked about secret evidence and then yes. back in, you know, back in 2000 when, when George Bush was running, um, you know, uh, against Al Gore, uh, the, a hot button item at that time was the trial of um, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor L. Arian. Right. In Florida, sure. and 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 the secret evidence that that George Bush specifically was questioned about and asked about referred specifically to that trial. So I mean, this is all you know. And and, and what was he accused of? It was again, you know, uh, supporting Hamas, supporting terrorist organizations in Palestine. Um, so I, I think it's all for, sort of frames. It's all framed within that overarching yeah. discussion. But I mean, it, it could be a number of things, right? Is yeah. that um, in in a post nine eleven national security madness era? Um, we have to arrest people and we have to, you know, excite fellow Americans about the fear of terrorism to continue to justify the fact that that the defense budget grows and grows and grows. Um, There is, of course, the Israel-Palestine question, right? Is that time and again, and this is something that, you know, has, that there are people who have been arrested and harassed on this issue for for so long is Palestine solidarity activists are generally the first to be targeted. Um, it, It doesn't, and again, like this isn't something that I remember very much because I wasn't involved at this time, but Hamas wasn't always labeled a terrorist organization. Prior to them, the the PLO was labeled a terrorist organization, right? Today, like we negotiate with them, but we don't negotiate. Like it, it's crazy, but there's this idea that people who do that kind of solidarity work are, are targeted. Um, the Anti-Defamation League just a couple of days ago published its, you know, 2013 top 10 anti-Israel activists in the country list. And again, not not to sound like conspiracy theory, you know, bells, but it doesn't escape me that APAC is one of the largest lobbying organizations in this country, that the ADL, which bills itself as a civil rights organization, publishes a list of people who are anti-Israel. It doesn't make any sense. If I, if CARE were to publish a list of people who are anti-Saudi Arabia or anti-Pakistan, people would say, well, what are you doing? Hmm. Um, And in that same way, the ADL has targeted groups like the Holy Land Foundation. They targeted groups who, who stood in solidarity with the Holy Land Foundation and and yet they hold themselves out as a civil rights organization that, that cares about Muslims. They've opposed Park 51. They've opposed Al Jazeera. Um, they've opposed the Irvine 11. And, and the list goes on. And so there's a number of reasons one, one could say it. And that said, bad law is, is itself a reason, right? The material support laws are bad right now. And, and the Holy Land Foundation was the way we learned that, um, the more difficult way. Mm-hmm. And I believe, uh, Pervis, there was some other... Well, I mean, I, I think Zara touched on, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. I, wait, I guess maybe just how, how it comes back to care, right? right? Is that Holy Land Foundation is accused of sending money to Hamas, uh, right. which they did. They sent money to the charity arm of Hamas before Hamas was labeled a terrorist organization. But ordinary Americans just hear Hamas. Mm-hmm. And CARE is accused of being an unindicted co-conspirator with Hamas. And so frequently... Uh, our detractors outside of the Muslim community will call us Hamas affiliated, um, you know, uh, unindicted co-conspirators like involved in this trial for funding terrorism. And our response to that is that the the trial of the Holy Land Foundation Five and, and that organization was unjust. Um, it is a blemish on you know on on U.S. law and, and our reputation. Um, and you know more so you know more specifically on care that both the Bush administration's uh, Department of Justice and the Obama administration's Department of Justice both reviewed the evidence against CARE, whatever it was, that I don't think we ever saw that got the government interested in us to begin with and said there is not sufficient evidence to bring charges, that elected officials, you know, attend our events, that we have, you know, now multiple dozen CARE nonprofits across the country functioning um, is, is evidence of the fact that, that it was all baseless, that it was part of a smear tactic. And we remind our community, as well as our allies, that groups like the ACLU, like the NAACP, like the National Lawyers Guild, who are prized American civil rights organizations, experienced very, very similar things just less than 100 years ago. And so it's almost like this is another, you know, going back to your rite of passage idea, that this is another rite of passage for a community that... I don't want to say that we take it as a badge of honor that, that we are sometimes um, attacked, but, you know, you don't attack ineffective people. You attack mm-hmm. those that, that really pose a threat to the status quo. Now, there's also a book that was written a couple of years ago called... Uh, uh, Muslim Mafia. Muslim yes. Mafia. Yeah. And that purports to be kind of the 
the pulling expose. the curtain back. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, what's and there's an interesting story because the, one of the authors, right, right, served as an intern. So oh yeah, there's a yes. sorted history there. Right. So yeah. there's there was a man who oh. sent in his son to um, and pretended to be Muslim, um, came into intern at a care office. I was going to say infiltrate, but right, yeah. Right, infiltrate. Yeah, yeah. And well, you know, I, I hope that at best, when yeah. we talk about infiltrators with the anti-war right. community, yeah. we always say, you know, you never know who the infiltrators are. So if you think someone is, you give them more chairs to lift, more tables to move. Like, <laughs> take advantage of the free labor while you there have you it. Go. It's on yeah. someone else's right. dime. Because um, we can't always worry about who the infiltrators exactly. are. Like, that, that is something that happened during COINTELBRO. It breaks organizations. It breaks movements. If I don't know that I can trust... Zaki and Pervez, then I'm not going to do this podcast interview. And and so instead, yeah. you know, was like I, I asked Zaki to move the chair. Um, I'm joking. Um, and but, I did. <laughs> and um, so, but the other thing that, that strikes me as funny about this is, is people pretending to be converts to Islam to get good mm-hmm. treatment. Like, I don't know if that's a reflection on our community or a reflection on their misconceptions, right? Is that I would hope that someone could walk into a mosque and, and be treated with dignity and respect, even if they didn't pretend to be a convert to Islam. And mm. and at CARE, we regularly have interns and staff who are not Muslim, who are allies um, of, of other faiths and of no faith at all. But this man, um, one of the Galbats men, uh, came to CARE National and said, you know, I want to intern at your office. So he did a bunch of work. He stole lots and lots of documents. I think it was something in the ring, over 10,000 documents. Mm. And they published a, a tell-all book about, about CARE and our and our mission um, and what we're doing. And one, I didn't read the book. I, I, I confess, I didn't read it. I, I didn't have time. Um, it, it just wasn't of interest. But I remember, at least from the media buzz at the time, one of the most um, frightening findings uh, of their investigation into CARE was that CARE sought to influence public policy by facilitating internships in, in Washington, D.C. It's what every good advocacy organization does. It is a very American thing to do to try to influence policy by placing staff um, in, in the right places who, you know, who represent certain communities. And and so if that was the best they could find, right. I'm not so worried. Uh, well, but and, and certainly the, the book had enough of an impact that you had Congress people like Sue Myrick, Trent Franks, uh, John Shattuck, Paul Brown, uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, a specific Kind of course yes. within Congress, admittedly, uh, calling for an investigation and whatnot. And I, I mean, I can find connective tissue from that happening, which was in 09, to, you know, just a year or so ago when Michelle Bachman hmm. was talking about Huma Abedin right. and how, you know, as Hillary yeah. Clinton's yeah. brotherhood. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, we really see yeah. this, this sort of interchangeable mm-hmm organization labels like it doesn't matter what the organization it's is the, the, yeah, yeah the, the accusations are always the same right it feels like right um you know, for those that aren't familiar with all of those congressional names you mentioned <laughs> i think that you know in a nutshell what i would say is that those are the most far right leaning members of congress and and a number of that's them saying something these days yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly right and, and a number we're just of them coming are off the right. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly um they and and so the thing that I, I would maybe push back on and say is important to highlight is as many members as came, if it, no more members mm. came out on the other side of it and said that care should not be attacked this way, that care is following the American legacy of, of civil rights where people like Judy Chu, like Mike Honda, who said, we know what happens to communities right. who are targeted, that it is un-American to call advocacy work. Um, problematic or, or, you know, everything else that they were saying. And, and they said, we welcome your interns. And, and I think that, that that's sort of, that that's important to be highlighted just so people aren't scared. Um, is there a constant fear mongering within Congress? Yes, absolutely. This is true on a number of issues. People, they're, they're, they're scared of, um, of gay marriage impacting, you know, little kids and, and, and that they're scared of healthcare, you know, changing the way we live. They're afraid of Muslims infiltrating and, and practicing Sharia. They, they are scared. And I think that a lot of that is that fear sells that fear sells. It, it both raises money and, and brings in votes. And so they've mastered a strategy. Um, Glenn Greenwald and others recently talked about who is taking money from the drone lobby. And, and I know we're not talking about drones, but I think that they're, the, the example is, is is helpful because it's what you're finding is that the people that are promoting the most fear are generally the ones that are also taking war money mm. and, and pushing war. And, and that's a problem, right? And it, it does all tie together. 
Well, and, and just when you say fear sells, I mean, that brings to mind the, fear the Inc. Fear Inc., yeah. which, uh, Wajahat Ali, which I think all, yeah. all three of us, are, we're all, yeah. we all know him, helped pen the idea of the Islamophobia mm-hmm. industry. And I wanted to pivot a little bit and talk about the times that you've sort of found yourself as a target of the Islamophobia industry, because I'm sure you have some stories that you can share about the times that you've sort of engaged or, or been engaged by these people. So, yeah, so for those that are not familiar with Wajahat's uh, report, it, two things to highlight. One, uh, this was a report re- you know, done by the Center for American Progress, I think, in 2010 or 11. 11, and, 11, and it showed that there was over $42 million being um, spent by, I think, about seven foundations to, to spread anti-Muslim sentiment. There's actually a newer study that adds to that, and this is it's called Legislating Fear, and it was issued by our national office, by Care National, in 2013, and it shows that over $119 million has been spent from 2008 to 2011. And, and give yourselves a second to think about what you could do with $119 million like that. I mean, maybe that was a career choice we should have explored when we graduated <laughs> from right, law school. That's right, that's right. Um, and the way Your they offers got, would have been rescinded. Right, right. Day. Well, the way they got to those bigger numbers was they looked at the inner <laughs> core of, of anti-Muslim activists, so people who whose primary job is peddling hate, and then they looked at the outer core, right. so people who are doing it secondarily. So Fox <laughs> News, you know, as much as we, we love to make fun of it, is, is not, a secondary. That's right. right. Is that they're, but they're also taking in a lot of money. Some of it being from a Saudi prince, which I never understand, but, but that... Aside, um, you know, whose money seems to be everywhere, right? I, I mean, yeah. except except for like you know when I want to go shopping. Um, <laughs> but that said, um, right. <laughs> we had a staff member join us recently, and a couple of days onto the job, she said, "Sahra, have you Googled yourself and seen what they say about you?" And uh, I was like, "Yeah, yeah I, I have." And the first time I was attacked by an Islamophobe online, I think it was about two thousand six or two thousand seven, and. It was, I think it was Daniel Pipes and, and his friends. 2006 or 7. So this yeah, is before. before care. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Wow. Um, I was accused of helping organize a protest against Daniel Pipes at, in, at UC Irvine. The funny thing was I was 400 miles away in the Bay Area. Like, I had already moved here, so I had nothing to do with wow. it. But there was a video about it. They had gone through and called my entire internet presence. They knew when I'd gone to Hajj. They asked who paid for it. Like, there was, it was really frightening. Holy moly. Yeah. Um, and I was just, you know, a, a first year law student, uh, thinking how is this going to impact my job hunt? Right? <laughs> um, but fast forward a couple of years later when I'm interviewing for work at care, they say, well, you know, it's a part of the job that this is going to happen. Like it's not a job requirement, but it sort of <laughs> becomes one because, uh, the Islamophobia industry insists. And I said, well, I, I think it'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it is something that impacts the individuals that do the work. It is something that impacts their families and their careers. Like, and it's a price that that people pay for yeah. for doing work on behalf of the community, and one that you know we laugh about, and at the same time should be taken seriously. Like as much as it is a badge of honor, it is also a cost. Sure. Um, and and I don't mind. Like I I take it as a compliment. Um, I think most recently the investigative project on terrorism or some Steve Emerson project wrote you know a sixteen page report on me, which was just them like cutting and pasting all of my tweets into into a, a into a nice pretty document like I, I appreciated that they put some effort into it and, and I'm not you know unhappy when they pick a good picture but I'm also you know worried that it can impact new staff it can sure. impact uh, the community's own willingness to get involved so right? the, the psychological yeah. right well and and to that point I mean just to speak from from personal experience as we mentioned before yeah. we started recording my wife used to work here and I remember her coming home one day and just being traumatized yeah. because she did Google her yes. name and, and you know, you, you all know my wife, she's the most non-confrontational person on earth. So the fact that people were like, well, and using her name, she says blah, blah, blah. And she was just heartbroken. Yeah. And, and I remember being like, it's, you know, it's it's, okay. it, these are, you, these people don't know you. And it's, I mean, for me, my, I mean, for mine, the, the only hate I get on the internet is like, he didn't like Batman. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the extent of the hate that I get. So it's just very different. I work, I, I yeah. move in very different circles. <laughs> <laughs> people are very mean. Until this that. podcast. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll see what go. happens. You know? yeah. This is this is me just trying to get on their radar. Really. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying really hard. But but I mean, and uh, there was there was an I believe, and maybe I'm I'm misremembering, but there was uh, a link that I saw that you posted where somebody uh, mentioned you as oh the part Clarion of, Project. That's yes. right. That's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Clarion. Um, you know, one of the questions I got when I sh- so I try not to share. Uh, 
information from those organizations because I don't want to drive traffic to them. If they're collecting money off the ads and the clicks and the visits, then I don't want to help with that. And at the same time, sometimes I do. Um, I just turned 30. Like I started this work when I was 25. I mean, I was an activist before that, but like I joined Care at, at about 25 or 26. And and sometimes it, it can be really flattering. Like I, I'm honestly humbled to be, to be listed alongside some of our communities, luminaries and giants. Like there's just, you know, I don't, I don't have Imam Sage Shakir on speed dial, but I know there's an Islamophobic website that thinks I do. Hmm. Um, and, hmm. and so things of that sort. And so, so it's weird, right? Like, so there's that. And then I think the other piece of it is it's also the reason that I sometimes share these things because our community and, and I think our allies sometimes don't realize how severe it is that yeah. if you have hundreds of millions of dollars being spent to create fear of a community, not everybody interacts with it at level one. Mm -hmm. They frequently get the trickle down. So everybody knows that Fox News is Islamophobic. They don't get the Fox News is Islamophobic because there's a number of really well-paid professionals who make four to ten times what I make, right? Um, being paid to pedal that slowly into Fox. And so sometimes seeing level one um, can help our community understand um, and our allies understand what we're up against, but also the need to continue to push back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I've yet to meet a reasonable American who thinks that some of the, the really vile stuff that comes from the Pamela Gellers, the Robert Spencers, these leading Islamic activists is, is acceptable. But sometimes it's about exposing it. Well, and, and like you say, I mean, there, there's so much money involved here. I mean, I mean, you mentioned Pamela Geller. I mean, she's made a very nice living for herself by just being a yeah. hateful person. You Potentially know? early retirement. Sure. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, okay, so, so you mentioned five years. You, you've been here five years. Uh, what's, what's changed for you? What, what, how has your mindset evolved or matured or uh gotten wiser because obviously you you know a lot more now having been here than you did when when you, you started right what do they say like the more you think you know the less you actually do or, or something of that sort um so yeah it's something like this is i'm planning now my fifth banquet but so i've been here a little over four going into five now um and i i have learned that i can't do it all myself I have learned that it's really, I think I've really learned to put into practice that, that we do the absolute best we can, uh, that, you know, as Muslims say, we, we tie our camel and then, and then we trust in God. Um, and I've learned that there's a lot to do. I don't know that much has changed in terms of the way I approach civil rights work per se. Like I, I would hope, and, and maybe my friends and family will tell me different, but I would hope that I'm that I'm still in your face and, you know, and, and uncompromising when it comes to protecting the community. I think that maybe a growth piece for me that I've really appreciated is, is the ability to focus on community organizing. I, I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer that got to interact with people, um, that I didn't want to be, you know, writing briefs or letters or, you know, being obnoxious all day, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I wanted to actually talk to and interact with the people that we serve that. And, and so that's sort of a, a continuing thing for me is, keeping in mind that I don't know everything, that, that the staff will never know everything, that the best and most authentic voices, the people that are, are best able to, to sort of share what, what they need are our community members. And so looking at ways to build that into, into the organization's work, right, and, and continue to hold us accountable to the community, that it can't just be that we go to the community when they have a civil rights problem or when we need their money to, to help us sustain our work, but rather that, that we interact with them on a regular basis, that we engage them in, in setting what our priorities are, what our strategies are, and, and what they do and don't like. You know, as, as great of a conclusion as that is, I mean, I think I'd be remiss because I, some, one of the things mm -hmm. I did really wanted to ask you was, and, and, and this goes to something you just you, you also just mentioned or touched on is about building alliances. Um, it is I know that very recently, for example, the Philadelphia chapter of mm -hmm. Care hired uh, yeah. your counterpart Jacob Bender, right, yeah. who is a Jewish American, right. And so the you know I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And I mean I think this also kind of come from, comes within that overarching discussion that we've been having. Oh, well, and that definitely yeah. plays into the optics of the organization. Right. So, right. so yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. You know, I, one of the things that I really love about Care is how large and how diverse it is. And by large, I don't mean well-funded and lots of money. And, you know, it's, it's not a big corporation. It's a 
network of community-based organizations that hire people that the community can trust, that are from the community, that are allies, um, and that do the work. And, and this has really, I think, been a key to, to care success. Not like putting aside for a second people of other faiths, like even within you know Muslim staff, we have Sunnis, Shias, we have people who wear hijab, people who don't, we have people who are imams, people who pray, and, and maybe people who don't, right? And, and that is itself a way that we ensure that, that we are actually reflective of the community that we serve. And as we continue to grow and evolve, um, to me, it speaks volumes that, that people of other faiths are applying to work at CARE, that they see the issues that CARE is working on and the strategies that CARE is employing as worthy of them committing their time to serve another community. At, at our own office in the Bay Area, we have a Jewish American uh, civil rights attorney. And, you know, people will sometimes ask, like, what what drives her to do the work that she does? And, you know, our attorneys can can make more money elsewhere and and probably work fewer hours and and not have to read hate mail or deal with the FBI. But they are allies and they see standing up for justice as as an obligation, as part of their faith and their, their own sort of individual being. And, and I respect that duty. and I welcome it. Yeah, There's yeah, civic yeah, duty. Yeah. And, and, and it would be problematic for us to turn away qualified, enthusiastic supporters who, who want to help. Um, I think the other piece of it that, that is really important to us as a civil rights organization is that when our job is to enforce non-discrimination policies, it makes sense that we would also then put those into practice in, in our organization. Sure. The best person yeah. for the job is the best person for the job, irrespective right. of who they pray to or, or how they pray. Right. Or their political persuasion or anything yeah. else for that matter. Right. right? I mean, yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, again, if, if, and, and I would much rather hire a, a Jewish American ally who, who gets the issues and who's willing to yeah. serve the community than maybe, I don't know, not to drop any names, but like a American Muslim leader who thinks Peter King is a good congressman and, and wants to talk to the FBI without an attorney present. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> Well, as we wrap things yeah. up, I, I first of all, I want to thank you for coming on our show and sharing sharing your Muslim American experience because it, it is uh, something that people can learn from, and uh, not not just as as uh, somebody who represents care, but also uh, as a prominent Muslim woman who's wearing the hijab. I think uh, that it, in itself is a statement, and it, it's a powerful one. Uh, as as we do with all of our guests, we say, is there is there an online platform where people can seek you out? Is there, uh, for example, if you'd like to share your Twitter? Uh, I don't know if you do, to be honest. But <laughs> sure. So um, people who are on Twitter can definitely uh, look me up for um, for for messaging about civil rights, as well as um, my sweet tooth at. Uh, just Zahra Bilu. So my full name is my Twitter handle. People who are interested in CARES work can learn more about it, can get help, can get involved, um, and can, you know, support it if they're interested at uh, ca.cair.com. And there we go. And uh, as as we wrap things up, I want to thank once again our audience for the, the really uh, pleasant response to the show. Uh, please send us emails uh, and any communiques, questions, comments to diffusedcongruence at gmail.com. And we're also now available via iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Uh, we'll look forward to reconvening in one month with our next guest and hopefully sometime down the line with Zahra once again uh, to for an update on all that's new and exciting. Thank you so much. So on behalf of uh, Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zara. Again, I wanted to just echo what Zaki said, and thank you for the listening audience. Uh, we hope you join us next time for another exciting guest. And I'm Zaki Hassan, and thank you for listening.